Hey everyone, just before we get into this episode, just a quick announcement. We have some new stuff on our web shop. Uh, we've t-shirts, some cool posters, and some signed copies of Matt's book, Painted People. So it's beneaththeskinshop.com and the link is in the description of this episode. Anyway, back to the show. Did you enjoy your pub lunch? I did. Why do you know what I had for lunch, Tom? Are you following me around? Yes, I have installed <laughs> cameras inside all of your jackets. So, like, every button has a little camera in it. I mean, the amount of um, the amount of you know uh, weight that I put on at times, I'm surprising you can fit some cameras in my jackets. But, <laughs> but no, um, we have a very... Ha-ha, we fooled you, listeners. Yes, we are in the same room. You can tell by the incredible quality of Matt's mic. <laughs> Almost in touching distance. Almost within touching distance. Oh, I did laugh, Tom, that you said the other day when I, we got the new mic that it was, going to, it was going to sound amazing. And then um, I hadn't, well, the drivers were playing up and it wasn't set up properly at my end. So actually it sounded worse than usual. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe something's in retrograde. I don't know. But you're very welcome to Beneath the Skin, the show about the history of everything told through the history of tattooing. And me and Matt are in the same room. Matt yeah. has come into my work. And we are downstairs recording. We just had a lovely quick pub lunch in yep. the Dove on Broadway Market in Hackney. And then later on, we're going to wrestle. Yes, nude. <laughs> um, you were saying we should do Beneath the Skin After Dark. Yes. With ASMR. Yes, just like... Feel the quality. Maybe you could do um, like relaxation tapes or something. I don't think I have the voice for that. I definitely don't. It wouldn't be very relaxing listening to me before you went to bed, would it? Yeah, because it was just you spiking the volume, just like a randomizer. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, so. you just blown everyone's ears open. Yeah, don't worry, I'll fix it in post. Um, yeah. You, you told me you weren't going to fix anything in post today. No, no, it's all live. It's all raw. It's coming to you raw. Um, if You would have gathered that I am Thomas O'Mahony, one of your co-hosts, and I am joined by my esteemed co-host, Dr. Matt Lauder. Hello. Sitting four feet away from me. Bonjour, bonjour. It is a pleasure to be here. Um, and yeah, you know, uh, as I was just saying to you before we came on, um, it is a real pleasure to do the show with you, Tom, because I get to do fun things. And um, you know, this weekend we're doing we're doing a fun thing. Yeah, we are at Brighton Tattoo Convention booth one oh nine. We by will, the toilets. By the toilets. So if you need to use the lavatory, uh, why not pop in and say hello afterwards after you've washed your hands or before. Or before, <laughs> because that is the perfect excuse. Because Matt will talk for twenty minutes if in uninterrupted or without you walking away from the conversation. So you could say, "Oh, sorry, I need to use the loo." I did, I did do a um a thing the other day uh with friend of the pod uh, Paul King. We did a little anthropology conference in the US, um w- where part of it was pre-recorded. Um, we and the videos were 20 minutes long and the guy who was recording them said I was the only person that did 20 minutes without a break and didn't need to be recut. Sometimes when we're recording this podcast, <coughs> I wonder when are you going to breathe? <gasps> you know, just, mm. there's no off on the genius switch, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> but um, since we are talk, since we are going to Brighton this week, we decided we would do probably an episode that people have anticipated for a while we're going to talk, do a brief potted history of tattoo conventions. Yeah, we are. And like, it's it's going to be very potted and there's definitely more detail. I think we'll, we'll do it future, in future episodes where we can get into some more specific things in more detail. But basically, I'm, I'm, I'm just finishing up um, my next book at the moment. Uh, it's sort of um, all the text has been sent to the publisher. Um, I'm sorting out the images. Um, it's a... It's still untitled. It's a bit, it's a history of the tattoo industry, basically, and, and a big part of that is um, tattooers getting together to talk to each other, and then tattooers getting together to show what they can do mm-hmm. to the, the rest of the world and show off what they do, um, show off what they do to to the to the public, right? To and, and not just public, public, but but to you know. Um, 
the media to TV to magazine writers. And yeah, like conventions have been this really interesting way of, you know, uh, the, the book The book basically charts this kind of emergence of the tattoo industry kind of quote unquote out of the shadows in some respects from the early 1800s, early 18th century, early 1700s. Um, and the tattoo convention, so to speak, and certainly the, the forerunners that we'll talk about today as well, are the ways by which um, tattooing and tattooers like come together and advocate for what they're doing. And, and it's a it's a big part of actually the, you know, we we joke all the time. I even say it's, it's a nice meme now. I see people joking about it on the um, on the Patreon, uh, but we joke, you know, about this kind of not just for sailors anymore story um, that's so persistent in tattoo history for the Western industry, but like. The tattoo convention is a big part of that, not just for sale story, because it's a chance where anyone, even if you're not getting tattoo, you can come and see tattooing live, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it is interesting in terms of its development over time, whereas like now it really marks tattooing being a quite mainstream industry as well. Like if you go to a convention like Brighton, you will see so many you know, not just tattooers, but also retail spaces, events. And it's kind of, it shows that tattooing is just as much a culture and industry as it is an artistic medium now. Yeah, exactly. And again, like a big part of, I mean, again, we'll get into, I think, like tattoo conventions were have been a way for, yeah, to kind of advocate for the industry, to kind of say, this is what we're doing take us seriously we're professionals we are you know we're not we're not just these kind of back alley scratches uh we're we're, we're serious artistic professionals who want to be you know taken seriously um as as uh you know as pros um and maybe the first place we started, what was the first convention you went to was brighton last year no yeah how come you'd never been before i don't know it's like it, for a long time my interest in tattooing was very singular and very individual it was like me being into tattoos, going to get tattooed. And it was only, I suppose, like me not just not just doing the show, but also like trying to kind of cover it from a perspective of someone trying to understand it. That like, you know, I went to Brighton last year and it was just such an incredible experience yeah. that, you know, it made me want to dig into, you know, what are the differences between, you know, conventions in different countries, in different regions you know, different times of the year because it's kind of a year round thing. Yeah. I mean, so for me, I went to, um, I got my first tattoos done at a convention. Um, I think I've told this story in the pod before. Like I, when I was younger, I got obsessed with tattooing. I didn't want to go to get tattooed in tattoo shops. And I, I sort of convinced myself from having seen tattoos in magazines and, um, you know, things like um, Modern Primitives and Tattoo Time that I wanted an American tattoo because the American tattoos that I saw in these publications were like so much better than anything that mm. I saw my mates getting done in Essex. Um, and so it wasn't until I went to a tattoo convention. I was living in France. I was working, um, doing a kind of year out from uni. Le petit mat. Le petit moi, oui. Um, uh, translating, working for a, for a big industrial um, metal fabrication company in France. And there was a big... Um, tattoo convention out uh, there in Belfort, uh, which is sort of very interestingly placed on the sort of corner of France, Switzerland, and Germany. I have a long-standing tattoo convention there, and I went, um, and, and and there was an American tattooer there, a guy called Jack Mosher, um, and because he was American, I got tattooed, got tattooed by him. He was amazing. Um, Turns out the things I got tattooed, just some black stars on my wrists, I could have got tattooed anywhere. <laughs> anywhere. Um, but it was a real eye-opener for me. And I think the other thing as well, right, and this is maybe part of this story of tattooing emerging into the public eye, is that I had always found tattoo shops, and still do find tattoo shops, very um, emotionally intense places. And I told Alex Binney, uh, for example, that I walked into Into You once, um, years before I was ever tattooed and walked straight out again because it was so, so overwhelming. And I still find that, you know, tattoo shops are, for all their, you know, even the shiny um, posh ones, are places of real kind of, you know, intense human connection. And I find that very powerful and very, and very, it's a very, very, very privileged spaces to be in. And so I don't know, for me, like going to a convention was like, 
it it felt safer in a way right because you could sort of go and you could be a bit of a and i you know always was this kind of spectator of tattooing i always wanted to go and watch uh, you know, I was always more. I was as interested in seeing people doing tattoos and learning about it than I was in getting tattooed initially. So, for me, going to a convention was just this absolutely incredible moment of um, of feeling like I could see what what this was really like. You know, mm. in in a fairly yeah. kind of safe way. Although one of the first people I saw when I walked into this convention was a um, guy who had in the old school days. This was two thousand. Um, yeah, um, summer summer two thousand. Uh, he had a um, he had a uh, a big cut out from his shirt, which is what people used to do. You cut cut holes in your clothing to show off the tattoos you had. Um, and this guy had a big back piece of a Confederate flag and a portrait of David Duke, <laughs> the, the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. And very funnily enough, there is like a TikTok that's going viral right now of like just you know. A guy saying, "Oh, average experience at a tattoo convention." I know it is based in the US, but it's like that's a swastika, that's a swastika, that's a stars and bars, that's a rebel flag. Well, I mean, I don't think so. I think that was a kind of particularly kind of you know French thing, and of course, like again, as we'll get into um, tattoo conventions, have also had their j'aime le david duke have their yeah oui uh, oh le racisme um have always had their kind of mystique but like they have also always since the very very beginning of 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 the modern era of tattoo conventions been a way for non-tattoo people the general public to come and kind of come and see what the fun's all about mm-hmm. and, and that you know that's been some of the some of the joy of them and also some of the controversy and also you know it has that kind of continuity with the history of very visibly tattooed people existing within, you know, traveling fairs and sideshows. It's kind of that, like, pay the price, you can come see them, but now is kind of mixed with this market stall, you know, setup. Yeah, and I think what separates the tattoo convention from the tattooed performing thing is also the function for tattooers to get together. Mm-hmm. Because actually, if we think about the the root, the, the roots of this... Um, and they're very contentious, and, and and there are different kind of accounts. But tattoo conventions really begin as a way for tattoo artists to, to network, ha- to hang out, yeah, yeah. and to sh- and you know, in, in, in eras before um, Instagram, eras before tattoo magazines, um, it was a way for tattooers just to to hang out, mm-hmm. right? Um, so I don't know, like probably maybe we can start with some of the history i mean the, the certainly the the things that inspired what would go on to become conventions are i don't know if they necessarily count as conventions in the modern sense because they're not they're not they don't have this kind of public yeah v- visibility but 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 they were meetings of tattooed people and of tattoo artists in japan um and so this is the meetings of um, again. I've apologised for my terrible Japanese pr- pronunciation before, but this is these are the meetings of the Edo Ch- Choyukai, um, the, um, the Tokyo Tattoo Club, basically um, the the kind of hard skin club, as they also get called occasionally. <clears throat> mm. Founded in the late nineteenth century, we did talk a bit about these with Pascal when Pascal mm-hmm. Bagot came, who's also going to be at Brighton Convention, by the way. We might speak to um, him at the weekend. Yeah. Maybe expect. A couple of mini episodes edited together next week. Uh, yeah, friend, lots of friends of the pod. But he, he, came, as you remember, he came. If you haven't listened to that episode, you you should do. He came on the podcast to talk about uh, uh, this guy called Akimatsu, who wrote a book um, about sort of a, a kind of thriller murder mystery set in the post-war context of one of the meetings of one of these um, Tokyo Tattoo Club. Meetings. I mean, you've seen those photos, right, Tom? Like, you've seen those famous photos of these guys, um, mainly guys, almost exclusively guys, in in bathhouses, often in in onsen in Japan, like hanging out, right? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, they that club's been going since the nineteenth century. Um, th- there are images of even by um, uh, Kunisada of like you know images of tattooed people hanging out. There's a, there are even more recent kind of pastiches of that from the 1950s of some of these um, members of the Edo Chogyukai hanging out in waterfalls and undergoing pilgrimages. There's some nice um, interviews with some of these uh, more kind of modern, or certainly like 50s and 60s um, pilgrims, visitors to these meet- these regular meetings of the Tokyo Tattoo Club where 
like you know, or some journalists will say, "Oh, you know, are you all yakuza?" And this will go, "Look, do you think a, do you think a yakuza could afford this?" <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, so there's something kind of important about um, about uh, a, a, about kind of tattooed people meeting together in Japan. And this is really like the the bedrock of conventions of them existing as this kind of meeting of community, like of not only tattoo artists but tattooed people. That's right, and it, and it's also a kind of it is a real kind of almost art appreciation thing, right? So, so there's a nice interview that Vice did with um, a recent kind of meeting, post pandemic meeting of the um, Edo Chuyuke. And they interview this guy who says, Horimono can cost millions of yen and the salary of Yakuza is low. Aside from top bosses, the thought that every Yakuza could afford to put one on their body is laughable. Um, but he says, you know, members come, this interview says, members come from a wide range of backgrounds and professions. Um, and yeah, it's basically a way um, for people to to, to 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 engage with this thing they love, almost as a hobby, right? This this guy that Vice interviews called uh, Matsuda. I don't need society's approval. He says I don't care if people understand or they don't. But it becomes this like I love tattooing. I want to be around tattooed people. I want to see people's tattoos, which particularly for this kind of Japanese back piece. Um, kind of stuff was wasn't on regular displays. So we wanted to see it. You had you had to go and meet up an onsen or waterfalls, places where you could bathe, were good places to kind of take your clothes off. And and these become, yeah, these become this kind of this kind of um, spur. I mean, it's almost like a pilgrimage, right? Like these get described as pilgrimages, and um, that the, 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 this Japanese group go um, to a shrine to places like you know, Mount Fuji. Um, but what happens is right so. Um, in in the 1940s, specifically 1948, like really sort of after the end of World War II, um, when Japan is full of Americans, you know, Japan's occupied by Americans from um, the end of the war until 1952, I think I'm right saying. Um, and that means there's lots of American interest in Japan, uh, again, you know, in a way that there had been a century earlier. And there's lots of American journalists embedded with the with the soldiers and so the, there's a, a real um, whole series throughout 1948 49 and 1950 there's a whole series of kind of um articles which everybody listening to i'm sure have seen photos from because the all these photos that you would have seen uh, have come from these articles particularly one that was published in life magazine in, in 1948 of the edo Joyuko meeting, you know, and they were kind of they weren't long articles. They were mainly pictorial, but they were ways of basically like showing to the Western world, like, hey, this is this is cool. This is like this is this strange thing that's been happening in Japan, and it's it's a way for these cool people to to meet, right? And also, like a- after post war, up until kind of the nineteen nineties, there was this kind of couple of decades long curiosity of subcultures that were happening in japan you know you have this you have the, the bozozuku kind of, a bit later yeah uh, the bozozuku, you have the kind of teddy boy revival in the 70s in japan yeah and like um this is again part of that kind of post-war oriental boom that that, that feeds into to a lot of stuff that comes afterwards the other thing these can these these meetings of the the post war meetings of the Edo Chuyukai have, and again, this is part of again of the um, of the Akamitsu book is um, is con- is competitions. Mm-hmm. So people coming together and sort of being judged and and having their having their um, tattoos judged. There's a great one of these um, 1948 articles actually, which is in a Canadian magazine um, called The Sphere. Um, it talks about like they hadn't been able to have any meetings during the war, so they were really pleased to see each other. They got really, really pissed mm. and um, on sake, and they had to cancel the judging because um, the none of the competitors could stand still enough to be judged. <laughs> they were all too pissed. <laughs> which, which, to which tattoo conventions are still quite. You know, even, yeah, yeah. even as like drink. I mean, I, even I start going to the conventions. You could drink on the ta- on the convention floor, and that's not always the case anymore. Um, but I love the fact that yeah, like from these very very early post war conventions <laughs> where <laughs> tattoo people are hanging out, they're they're too pissed to do the competition because everyone's too pissed to see or stand still. And it's, it's an interesting point because tattoo conventions and particularly competitions at tattoo conventions are kind of one of the really close points where tattooing crosses over into the kind of contemporary art world because you're judging a piece of art not only just because of its 
visual and artistic me- merit in terms of design, but also it, the form it takes, how it works with the body right. as a piece of art. We talked a bit about that as well on, uh, when we did our um, first episode, yet yeah, on Continuous I Can't Bear It episode about the Ink Master series, where I talked a little <laughs> about, the, about the history of tattoo judging, which comes from this same place. Yeah, um, and they also, actually, co- competitions, as we come back to, also become a bit of a, a point of... Um, uh, of conflict because either you know some either it, it gets thought of as a popularity contest and some you know create cliques some people think they're a bit self-congratulatory and they're not actually ways to talk to the public but only to talk to each other so the, the competitions also become a bit of a uh, a bit of a, a a bit of a source of drama and conversation over the decades that follow um but yeah all of these so all these ingredients tattooed people and judging and like some press but no no general public really are present in these 19 late 1940s japanese meetings of tattooed people again i don't know if we'd really call call them conventions in the modern sense right but what happens next is those photos are published in uh yeah in, in place like life magazine and sphere and other and others magazine in australia as well and they are seen then by UK tattooers and American tattooers and Australian tattooers and European tattooers. And they think, you know, tattooing at this point, as again, we've discussed before in the podcast, is really a bit of a low ebb. It's very stigmatized um, because it's associated with sailors. It's associated with stigma, with the horrors of um, you know, forced tattooing during the Holocaust. And also it's going out of fashion. It's going out of fashion because... Um, the world is changing visually. Everything's becoming sleek and minimalist and modernist. And tattooing is a bit too fussy and and, and not very in keeping with modern aesthetics. So tattooing is really kind of kept alive by the super fans in the nineteen uh, early nineteen fifties in the UK, for example. And the tattooers um, who are talking to each other through the pages of um, you know, correspondence in, in the back of magazines like World's Fair, which is a magazine for uh, sort of showmen and 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 and, and you know, travelling circus performers who had been since the nineteen thirties are saying, look, we need to like we need to put on a better face to the world, lads. We need to show something to the world. And so into that space really, in the vacuum that all of that causes, um, comes Les Goose. And Les Goose and the Bristol Tattoo Club Again, we will do a much longer and more involved episode about Scoose and his influence, but a lot of his influence really comes through this, again, not quite convention, but something which is sort of proto-convention. So Scoose, um, basically he's like, in 1953, he's, he's in his early 40s, but he's been tattooing for 20 odd years. He learned to tattoo from Joseph Hartley in Bristol. So he's young enough to kind of have the energy uh, and the vim and vigor to do it and uh, to, to bring people together, but he's also sort of being around long enough to, to to have some gravitas in the industry. And he basically thought, like, I want to do this. I want to do this. I want to kind of, you know, find some f- find my people. I mean, he says he did an interview in 1954, basically, that there was only eight tattooers left in the country. I mean, there was like eight good pros there were plenty of scratches around i mean this is this is a big point that they make right they're mm. like there's 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 a few of us that are good but he says um there there would have been him jesse yeah um there is like um there's like jack uh, zeke and cash cooper um there's ron ackers um and yeah not not many more there's a couple of other names but that, that those are the those are the kind of core of this group um, Rich Mingins as well becomes important. Um, so he starts this club, the Bristol Tattoo Club, in 1953. Basically, as a group, as a as a initially very very small thing in a pub in Bristol, right, where it's like literally sort of half a dozen people, basically. Um, but he says straight away to an interviewer because um, he he's quite canny. Like a lot of the people that we talk about a lot to this day are, are tattooers who've really engaged with the press and he was cl- quite a canny kind of media self-publicist uh, scoot, as well as a great tattooer as well. Um, but he basically said, yeah, um, I hope, quote, we could organise friendly competitions and it would help to raise the standard of the profession, one of the oldest in the world. Um, Les Scoose is a perfectionist, said the journalist. Um, I've never, uh, I have never been and never will be satisfied with techniques and equipments, he quoted Scoose as saying, nor with my own ability and my own designs. So, tattoo, so conventions are a way, I said, to hang out, to bring people together. 
and to also kind of talk about what they're doing as an art form, really, to be taken seriously. Um, again, he says, um, um, the impression is only due to ignorance. Many people, he says, think tattooing is common and degrading, only being patronised by people of low mentality. It's 1954. The impression is only due to ignorance and, and lack of understanding. And the Bristol Tattoo Club has been able to promote more fair and proper appraisal of tattoo work among the general public. Um, so, yeah, the first meeting, which was artists and clients, although, again, not straightforwardly members of the public, um, at a pub called The White Horse in Bristol. And then the following year, they moved to a, a space where they had about 60 people um, as part of the group. And then um, and then we get an immediate offshoot in London in uh, 1955, um, which is, again, beginning to feel a bit more like a modern convention because... Um, well, they advertise it in advance, interestingly. So Cash Cooper, for example, says to a newspaper, like, we're gonna be doing some judging. Um, we're gonna you know, we're gonna have some judging at this pub called the White Horse in Clerkenwell. Mm-hmm. Sorry, the horseshoe. The horseshoe in Clerkenwell. Uh we're gonna be doing judging. They invite the picture post, they invite um the Sunday pictorial, these sort of big illustrated magazines. Um and yeah. They come together and you've got Jesse and you've got um, Les Goose, you've got um, Rich Mingins and you've got a guy from uh, America called Al Shafley from Sandusky, Ohio, who'd heard about Les through um, publicity about the Bristol Tattoo Club and then decided to come to England. And they have this um, champion tattooer of all England competition in 1955, <laughs> which Les, of course, wins. Um, and Jesse comes, Jesse Knight comes second. Um and yeah, that if I had I, again, I don't think it's quite a convention because it's a meet, it's a meeting in a semi-public place mm. for tattoo enthusiasts. Hey, are you enjoying the show? If you really like Beneath the Skin and you want to help support us, you can do so on Patreon for as little as five quid a month. You can help make this show possible, help us buy research materials. So, if you like the show and you want to support us, consider kicking us a few quid a month and you'll get everything from bonus episodes to Q&As and you can even vote on what tattoo I'll get when we reach a certain subscriber count. Matt, have you got anything to say? You should really definitely uh, fund the Patreon because tattoo history is massive, right? Deep, wide, complicated. We're covering some big hit topics on the main feed, but on the Patreon subscriber-only feed, we'll be getting into some really more interesting niche deep topics you don't want to miss out on and honestly the chance to kind of decide what thomas gets on his body is probably just a once in a lifetime opportunity subscribe chuck us a few quid don't miss out on the chance to ruin thomas's body forever but one thing i think that makes this the perfect midpoint between the japanese meetups and what we'll see going into like the early 70s is the presence of press like this is being covered and reported on probably due to the media savviness of some people involved and like that is kind of a transformational element of the evolution from it happening in japan now it's the bristol tattoo club meeting in the horseshoe in clerkenwell and what we'll see going forward. Yeah, and that's right. As I said, and it's, as I said, it's for them, and this becomes really important and quite again a, a, a cause of conflict um, in a later part of the story that we'll get to. The the the, the telling a good story about the industry mm-hmm. that we are serious, we are hygienic, we are artistic and creative, we have a diverse to some degree client base. Like that's a that's conventions exist for that storytelling Mm -hmm. you know the the, the Bristol Tattoo Club is formed explicitly as I said you know in those first interviews that Les Goose is is giving to defend the industry at a time when it is really on its arse right and I think it it also talks a lot about you know tattooing's place as an artistic medium in the sense that like every other medium has had its kind of point of defense where it it's kind of its existence is being examined in a questioning way of like well, what does this mean? And this seems kind of like a bulwark against that observation. Exactly. Yeah, exactly right. And, and again, it's at a time when you are able, you know, there is a sort of birth of a mass media, the television starting and tabloid publications are becoming more. So it actually is a way that you can 
tell the story you want to tell um, as an industry, which is perhaps at odds. I mean, one one of the reasons that, that this not just for sailors anymore rhetoric is so prevalent because that's the story that tattooers have been telling mm-hmm. the press mm-hmm. for so long. And I think, you know, it, I think it is the cool thing about conventions and about tattooing in general is that it is in their own mind reinvented by every new tattooist that enters the industry. Tattooing yeah. only begins when they pick up a machine. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. what they're doing is their own take on it and I think it's what has sustained tattooing as a kind of community, an artistic form, an interest, a profession, is people getting involved and putting their mark on it. And at this point, this is Les Scu saying, you know, you have perceptions of what tattoos are, but this is what they mean to us, not just you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. It's this It's this way of taking that as you said, the voice that sort of is, is present in, that, in those Japanese club meetings as well of like, this is what we love and why we love mm. it. We love it because it's strange and beautiful and romantic and exciting. Um, and we want to, sh- we're proud of it. We want to show you why we love it. Yeah, exa- that's exactly right, man. Um, yeah, so so what happened, well, the, the, the following, uh, well, there's another really interesting l- link to, uh, that, uh, at that um, horseshoe event in 55 and it's the presence of uh rudy inhelder a young swiss man who we've talked about on the pod before um again who so we won't go on at length but this basically rudy is a tattoo fan um who'd seen about tattooing due to a, a book that had come out in 1954 the year before um he'd written uh, called pierced hearts and true love by a guy called hans ebertson he'd written hans ebertson so tell me more about that he said you should speak to this guy in london called rich mingins um and in Heldred, written to Mingins, Mingins is invited him to London, and there's this young Swiss guy uh, present in this space where literally there are photos of um, Les Scoos, Jesse, Rich Mingins, Les um, uh, Lone Wolf, um, uh, Horsler from Watford, another tower from the era, um, who people may have seen, and yeah, Al Shafley, and this, you know, In Helder's at that meeting, right, and it's he's absolutely captivated. Um, the Bristol Tattoo Club obviously continues, um, gets a lot of good press through the 50s. In the early 60s, um, or late, actually late 50s, Rudy Inhelder moves to America and he wants, again, we told this story in the pod before, he wants to meet people like him, um, not just tattoo people, but also gay men who are into tattooing. <laughs> uh, a whole other story. But um, so he thinks the way I can do that, particularly in New York at the time when tattooing had was very stigmatized and became illegal in 1961 we could basically again i I'll, i'm going to start my own version of the tattoo club um british tattoo club in new york so he started the tattoo club of america and there's very little information about this i looked very hard um it wasn't super publicized but he claims i mean i'm sure it happened i, I i'm not denying it happened but basically in um they had about 250 members in uh, by December 1964, and um, he organised a meetup basically for the Tattoo Club of America. And that is, I mean, all of these interventions so far have been called in various places the first tattoo convention. Um, this is even closer, I think, to to something that again feels a more modern. Part partly because for that. Rudy is actively inviting people to come. Mm-hmm. So he's like curating almost a kind of vibe that he wants to bring people together. And this is another evolution of the tattoo convention. Now we're taking another step where we're having someone taking a curatorial role. Yeah. And for him, you know, for him, it was a way to, um, again, to meet the tattooers that you wanted to meet, to bring people together. Um, October the 5th, uh, 1964. Um, there's so little information about it that I've been able to track down. Um, I don't even know where it was. It, I mean, it was in New York, um, but I haven't seen any photos that are definitely from that event. I know some people that were there, like Elizabeth Weinzel, who had become a real staple of American tattoo conventions for a long time after this, who tattooed by Burt Grimm, uh, who became known as like the kind of grandmother of American tattooing. She was there. Um, but again, that often gets called 
uh, a tattoo convention. I, I, in my new book, I, I call it the US, United States's first true tattoo convention. Although again, it hasn't got that kind of public face um, in the same way. Yeah, so I don't know. Like, I don't know if that is the if that is. I mean, I'm I'm calling it my book, so I probably should decide before I edit. I I think that does feel like a kind of tattoo convention again in this same in this kind of meetup of tattooed mm-hmm. because it's not just artists meeting together; it's artists and people with tattoos, yeah, but yeah, it's yeah. not really public facing. Um, so that then really I think brings us to like what does get called you know is on the Wikipedia. Yeah, you know, therefore it must be true. For example, <laughs> um, the first uh, tattoo conventions. I mean, there are a couple of other precursor things that get called this, like Kate Helen Brand, um, who uh, you know very very briefly worked for Ed Hardy and um, trained for a couple of weeks with um, Sailor Jerry. Like she describes a meeting um, in Hawaii as the first tattoo convention. Uh, this happened in the early 1970s. It was um, basically Ed Hardy, Mike Malone, Kate, Helen Brand um, going to Hawaii to stay with Sailor Jerry because Kazuo Guri was over from Japan. And that meeting of artists, Helen Brand has called on occasion the first tattoo convention. I don't, I don't really think that counts at all because I don't think it, the, there was any public there. It was just mm. some, some, you know, a big important group of the, the best tattoos in the world mm. potentially hanging out. Mm. Um, also, that it's like it's much more of like an informal event. This isn't something that is like necessarily like you know you're not selling tickets to. Yeah, it. you're not selling tickets, and also it's different in the sense of like the meeting of the Bristol Club in the Horseshoe that like. This is this pre-planned event where there's a competition and there's also an element of publicity as well. Yeah, yeah and I mean, there, and there are a couple again, a couple of other equivalents. Like Al Shafley, inspired by his trips to Bristol, like starts his own um, tattoo club. He works with Matt Milton Zeiss as well. Uh, they start a tattoo club and they have a couple of meetings where people are attending. Um, what one of the one of the kind of key distinctions that gets made and one of these is the international part, right? So does it matter that tattooers are coming from abroad? Mm. And of course, certainly at that 1955 London sh- event, Al Shafley was over from uh, from the US. I don't know for certain, but I'm, I I would imagine that there were some Amer- there were some foreign tattooers at that 1964 Rudy event because he was very connected in with European and English tattooers. So again, it's difficult to know where you draw these lines, but I think like, and and what counts but yeah the 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 real sort of most conventional answer to like when is the first tattoo convention is um 1976 um a tattoo convention that's held in uh Houston Texas um and yeah it's it's hosted by Lyle Tuttle um and a tattooer called uh, Dave Yerku and um, it's sort of gone down in history, really, I think, as this sort of first, you know, first major tattoo convention. So um, this was a period which has been called by um, uh, by Alan Govenar the tattoo renaissance, partly because of this. Uh, Lyle Tuttle had been on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine, much to Sailor Jerry's chagrin in 1970. <laughs> Jerry was giving out so many of those cards. So many of those cards. Um, but, you know, again, it, so so although tattooing was was coming into public um, view again in the, in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, it was also that, Again, as I put it in my in my next book, like increased visibility, br- increased popularity brings with it increased scrutiny. Mm-hmm. And so, for example, tattooing is banned in New York, and then bans follow in other cities in the U.S., include uh, in other states: Florida, Oklahoma, Indiana, Massachusetts. Nineteen sixty nine, um, there's a, a prosecution in England of a tattooer um, who was tattooing thirteen year olds, and it wasn't illegal at that moment. I mean. The, actually, this happened in 1965, I think, the, the, the law which followed came in 69. Um, there was no law tattooing underage people, um, but this guy got charged with essentially, you know, grievous bodily harm. So tattooers in the UK and England were worried of like, okay, there is a line somewhere where what we're doing is legal or not legal, but we don't know where it is. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, 
and because the it's kind of that situation where an industry isn't big enough or generates enough revenue for the government to pay attention to it therefore it kind of flies under the radar so they are in that precarious situation of we don't know necessarily what we're allowed to do and what we're not allowed to do yeah exactly and 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 and, and the savvy kind of old guard of the industry who are by this point connected through things like the Tattoo Club of America, they realise that something's coming. And um, although the tattoo, Rudy inhaled the Tattoo Club of America had folded, Spider Web in New York had formed a new version under the same name, partly to try and fight the ban. Tattooers realised if they wanted to stop being regulated and stop being banned, they had to show the world that they were a professional serious industry and so again conventions were a way for people like spiderweb and lyle Tuttle, um to, to show the world and, and yerku to show the world that they were and they were serious and it functions in the same way that like any kind of established industry has a kind of trade show if you're in the automotive industry there's automotive trade shows where every manufacturer is there you can go and look at Who's making the newest seat belts? Right, exactly. And actually, again, that, that dual function is, again, something that they've been very good at. So um, the writing's on the wall. And so Tuttle and, 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 and Dave Yerku, um, Yerku's running his own um, club called the North American Tattoo Club at this point, NTAC, um, which was a um, club primarily for artists. He basically said, quote, at the time, we wanted to get rid of the drunken sailor image. Um, you know, as I said, it's only the first international tattoo convention in a limited sense. Um, Al Shafley had been in Bristol and London and, you know, various other, other things, but, um, it, um, it kind of highlights as well, this contradiction that is at the heart of the tattoo industry as well as that, like, how can you exist as both an underground and kind of counterculture thing while also existing in the mainstream? Yeah. And this is something that I... I'm writing more academic work on as well and something I touch upon in Painted People like and something that um, uh, Margot DeMello talks about in an article she put out in the 90s called Not Just for Bikers Anymore where she argues that tattooing needs both of those things at once it needs mm. to be safe and respectable because that's the way you keep the cops off your back and the tax man off your back and but it needs to be dangerous and cool because it is actually but that but that is the main marketing point is that like this is the point that Zimello makes yeah no you need to be acceptable enough that you're not getting regulated out of existence and you have customers coming in but you need to have that edge as well to make them want to come in yeah and this is what i think and i argue this in the new book in the limited format i'm able to in, in in this kind of book but i argue really that this is the big contradiction at the heart of the tattoo renaissance because on the one hand you know history is is hailing this as like all the tattooers would go to art school by the 70s and you know tattooing's now on the in rolling stone and in art forum and the venice biennale um, but at the same time, it's only there because tattooers are making an active effort to do, make that happen because otherwise they're getting like char. I mean, there was a um, a serial killer um, uh, in the nineteen sixties um, whose name escapes me. Richard something. Richard but, Ramirez. Richard, no, no, not Richard Ramirez. Um, yeah. So um, yeah, the, you know, um, there's also this guy like Richard Speck who'd murdered eight nurses in 1966, and he had a he was identified because he had a born to raise hell tattoo. So tattooing, particularly in America, is in a is in a really. I mean, in in England, it's sort of treated as a bit of a, a an eccentricity still, uh, and in fact, a lot of the discussions around the ban in '69 are complicated by the fact that members of the House of Lords have tattoos. And it, it, yeah, it also highlights that once again, this contradiction between the the viewing of tattoos in the US versus the UK in, in a, sim- a way that's similar to a lot of things is that like a lot of things in the UK that in the US are treated as kind of on the fringes in the UK are just treated as like a little bit bawdy. Exactly. And yeah, a little yeah, bit yeah. like vaudeville. Yeah. Um. So anyway, like... This Houston event happens, and it's as it's sort of pitched quite deliberately as a as a publicity event. It's unclear. Like some people say, fifty people went. Some people say one hundred and fifty. Um, the Chicago Times, who turned up, said bikers galore, big beefy killer types with their backs and arms covered with skulls, panthers, and gross obscenities, which would make the average housewife blush. This is kind of like the um, the famous Sex Pistols gig in Man- in Manchester or Salford, whereas like 
yeah. you know, there's probably about 50 people there, but like thousands of people say they were there. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, also, I think people that I found who were there say there were 50 and people like the press say there's like 150. <laughs> so I don't know. Split the difference. Press hyperbole as usual. Hyperbole. Um, but but then they said, but there were plenty of housewives and they didn't blush. So the very, very first tattoo convention, you see things that is still coverage of tattoo conventions now of like, oh my God, there are women here. Right? <laughs> <laughs> like, this is fucking four, nearly 50 years ago. Oh. Um, there was a, also interestingly that, like, that they had a competition, um, a, a black woman, this woman called Val- Valeria Watson Deuce, who um, went on to be a really interesting fine artist, was crowned best tattooed woman. Um, they got a big splash in Esquire magazine, in fact, the cover of Esquire magazine. Um, There was a big um, presence from a a cool um, Austin, Texas underground magazine called Action Magazine. Um, And at that event, there were British tattooers, for example, and European tattooers. So, but yeah, so this is like, you know, this is, this is the, this is really hailed as, as, as this kind of the birth, right? Um, the other person, people that went, Ma- Ma- uh, Manfred Kors, um, friend of mine, uh, and and his mentor, Sammy, uh, Tattoo Sammy, Horst Schreckenbach, were there. Sammy did feel that that first event was quite introspective. So he had this similar idea of wanting to kind of promote tattooing to the world and was sort of, you know, amazing inventor, member of the Tattoo Club of America, very kind of interesting pioneer in in piercing as well he turned up and basically felt that the whole thing was a bit too introspective it was a, all the competitions was a bit too much of the in crowd mm. congratulating each other as a little bit navel gazy and not enough as far as he he was concerned talking to the general public really doing this kind of advocacy work um that that this was supposed to be doing um and he, for a couple of years afterwards, made that criticism directly to to, to the organisers, like you know, come on, guys. Um, but basically, this this sort of proved it worked. Um, and then the next event, and this is maybe where we'll finish up, uh, if we're doing this as a two parter. The next event is the following year, and it's the second international, the second international tattoo convention. Uh, it's in Reno, Nevada, um, which has the benefit of being nearer and closer to California, California had become this absolute kind of wellspring of incredible post-war tattooing. Um, and yeah, basically was, a, was, was um, again, something that Ed Hardy called in his book, like the first opportunities we, first opportunity we got to see the new tattoo. Um, so this is organized by, again, the North American Tattoo Club, this guy Dave Yerku again, um, but also in collaboration with an English organization called the ITAA, the International Tattoo Artists Association, um, run by a guy called Terry Wrigley, who tattooed up in Scotland, um, as well as other places, but mainly in Scotland. And, and, and Wrigley was, again, one of these key network members. He'd been a member of the Tattoo Club of America. He'd been a member of the Bristol Tattoo Club. Um, the, the ITAA was a club, unlike those other clubs, just for tattooers. And again, Wrigley wanted to get involved because he wanted to, he saw the writing on the wall. So he wrote um, at the time in their magazine, yeah, he said, we need an association to protect ourselves. It's funny, but the British Hang Gliding Association was formed last month. And hang gliding being popular in the UK for only four years, if an association hadn't been formed, hang gliding would have been banned. But because the newly formed hang gliding association was formed and gave an assurance it would police itself, hang gliding is allowed to stay legal in the UK. At a time when more and more local authorities want to ban tattooing, it would seem to be a good idea that the ITAA should police itself in regards to badly ran and dirty studios. How we can do this effectively, he foreshadowed, can only come about by discussion at the convention in reno that uh that i think is the most times i've heard the word hand gliding I know. when i was when i was copying out that quote to use it in the book i'm like he says hand gliding too many times but that's what he <laughs> says so, so yeah so tattooing was saved because of um because of hand gliding yeah there you go <laughs> <laughs> but once again like it is that thing where we're seeing all these elements of the modern tattoo convention slowly start to gather together it's like a meeting of people with collective interests, both as artists and enthusiasts, a element of publicity, um, this kind of regulatory pushback that like they see this is they're kind of getting penned in in terms of regulatory issues, and it is 
in the same way that like the automotive industry or any kind of commercial industry has these kind of conferences to co- have a kind of mind share of opinion they're doing that as well yeah it is also don't forget a bit gatekeepy yeah because you can see there it's like we have an idea of what tattooing should be and you're either in or you're out right because they're we're drawing the rules up now and you can see i mean this happened this is one of the reasons for example that modern art exists right because there was the french salons and the american art salons in their wake and people like duchamp weren't able to show their conceptual work in those you know in the early early 20th century 1917 uh, um, and the few years before that so like this, there's also a kind of there is also kind of a gatekeeping thing here yeah right yeah. who's who's the cool kids yeah. who's part of our club yeah and i think that's where we're going to leave it today oh I think. cliffhanger for houston okay yeah so for, we, for, for for reno okay good. yeah we will pick that up in our second part of this history of tattoo conventions in two weeks time if you want to hear it early maybe check out the patreon if you're already a patron you're probably hearing this the day we're recording it um for everyone else you've heard it two weeks later but uh, with that in mind uh, i want to thank all of you for listening for anyone who's hearing out on the patreon if you're going to brighton booth 109 we have shirts posters postcards stickers you can have just have a chat with us matt will have books you can also get tattooed by sammy hellroy tattooing out of jesse knight's best of book and you'll also be able to buy a copy of jesse knight's best of book and as always uh, we have a Patreon. Like I said, you can hear episodes like this early. You can hear bonus episodes. And I also have to thank our £10 and above patrons. You can subscribe for as little as £3, whatever really works for you. But without further ado, a special thank you to Stephen McCann, Roy Hock, Roy Hoxema, Morpheus Ravenna, Chris Block, Charlie Lightning, Bob of Extra, Shit Jesus, Reed Forden, Lupe Calderon, Garnic- Garnica, Kirsten Wright, Kathleen Burkhardt, James Schick, and Dylan, thank you. And thank you to Matt. Matt, do you have any housekeeping for the end of this episode? Uh, only that I'm looking forward to seeing you all at Brighton. Thank you, Tom, for doing all the organisation, doing sorting all the shirts, sorting out all the printing. Um, yeah, and uh, we'll, we'll, I, I'm excited to chat to to everyone about, about tattoo history. We'll, I'll be showing some, um, like I did at the London convention, showing some archive tattoo film all kinds of fun things and obviously i will bend everyone's ear off so i know some listeners came to the last convention that um i was at so it'd be, it'd be awesome to see you all and thank you for listening once again and it is goodbye from me bye bye, bye.